to Rock This Universe Actors Edition. I am your host, Chantal Herman, and this is the official podcast for the saactors.rockthisuniverse.com website, the only website dedicated to the inspiration and education of the professional South African actor. And yeah, it's 2018, and I'm so happy that you guys are here because uh, there's some pretty important stuff that we need to talk about. And, uh, you know, we've got the Me Too movement that is literally be like swe sweeping the world from America right across, really affecting everybody in the form and television industry. And it's making a lot of people incredibly skittish. And I think it really is about time that we start talking about it. I must admit that I have consciously decided not to post uh, too much about it on the Rockers Universe group, purely because I wanted to make sure that once we really start talking about it, that we really understand and get to grips with the actual subject matter that we're dealing with. And that is why I've invited Zoe Ramushu on with me today. Uh, and we'll be talking about SWIFT. She is the official spokesperson of the, what is it, South African Women in Film and Television. Uh, it is a South African-based, not-for-profit organization working with African women in the film and television industry. So uh, they've also just brought out a, a paper, a report, the Sexual Harassment and Discrimination Report, in response to the appalling incidents of sexual harassment and discrimination that women face in the workplace on a daily basis in the film and television industry right here in South Africa. So lots of stuff to talk about, but first a little bit about Zoe before we get started, because wow, she is a powerhouse of a woman and you need to know her. <laughs> Zoe Ramushu obtained her undergraduate degree in law and her honors degree in English at Wits University with a research paper focused on the portrayal of women in positions of power um, on television and also a master's degree in African studies where her research explores the portrayal of post-feminism in African cinema. She produces uh, broadcast content through her own production house. Uh, is it Chiriseri Studios? Is that right? Yes, correct. Yeah. And she is determined to produce content that is clearly African and of international standard for global consumption. As founding member of SWIFT and as a board member, she works to assist women in the film and television industries to achieve equal and positive representation both on and off screen. No mean task, and wow, here we go. <laughs> a very <laughs> warm welcome to Rock This Universe Access Edition, Zoe. Thank you so much, Chantal. I appreciate it. Oh, I really No, you, uh, I'm so glad that I finally, I finally pinned you down because you, oh. you were busy shooting PSAs for SWIFT. Is that right? Yes. Um, so SWIFT actually stands for Sisters Working in Film and Television because we wanted to be ah. not just women in South Africa. Um, and yeah, we were just up in Durban shooting um, six new PSAs. We have one that uh, was our sort of pilot called The Line Producer. So if you go onto YouTube and type in the hashtag, uh, that's not okay, you'll find that on there. And so what we've done now is we're shooting six more of these PSAs. But um, I'll give you more of the details as we go on with the conversation because it fits into, you know, our overall strategy as SWIFT as to... Sure. We're battling and you know dealing with sexual harassment mm, yeah. yeah absolutely okay so well let's start at the very beginning because you guys have only been around for about a year now and you're already making waves in the industry with what it is that you're working on but how did it get started and why did it get started so what happened is that um at the durban international film festival um in 2016 um so two years ago a bunch of women got together after the festival and just sort of, you know, an informal meeting to discuss, you know, issues around women and what they want and what they, you know, need from the industry and what, like, experiences they've had, et cetera, et cetera. And it just became apparent from that meeting that um, there was a need for an actual formal organization of women to work together. And so from that point... Um, Obviously, at the festival, we had people from Cape Town, Durban, and Joburg, as well as other um, areas of South Africa. But those were the three main regions where there is, you know, a sort of um, functioning um, and growing industry. And we set up branches in those three three cities, so Cape Town, Joburg, and Durban. And in those um, different cities, what we did is we took an entire year um, 
to basically, instead of stipulating what women wanted and what the needs were and, you know, sort of prescribing that, we sat and had meetings, like um, two to three meetings um, once a month where we just discussed, like, what is your issue? You know, what do you think, you know, you'd want from an organization like this? What are, what are, what are the difficulties you've experienced, particularly because you're a woman? Um, what would you like to see happening for women in the industry? And from that, we sort of got all and collated all that information and uh, created what we call our committees or our pillars um, where we address specific needs. So, I mean, one of the major needs was that, you know, as women, we need to be upskilled and empowered in the sense that in the industry, I mean, it's predominantly male. Um, it has been predominantly male. And, you know, getting access to technical skills as well as, you know, the positions of power, directing, being a DOP, you know, those kind of roles have been very safeguarded for men, you know what I mean? And so women were saying they need access to those sort of things. And access doesn't only mean um, skills and training because a lot of women are qualified, you know, they're very qualified for it. It's just that, you know, the, your, your gender says that you're not qualified and because you're a woman, you couldn't possibly know how to do X, Y, Z. So what we're doing is also creating opportunities for one another as women. Um, actively creating those spaces where someone who is qualified is given that opportunity. So that, as well as our masterclasses, is what um, was one of the needs. The second need that we really, really um, thought was pertinent was that a lot of women make films mm -hmm. and they just sort of are made and that's it. Like no one sees them. They, you know, there's some amazing stories by women, but there isn't a you know, there isn't an audience for them. They, an audience hasn't been created. So as SWIFT, what we do is we do screenings of women's films. So women um, directed films, women uh, led films, like where, you know, I, I mean, not only films, but I mean, there's a couple of uh, TV sh shows like Lockdown, this TV series mm -hmm. for Mzanzi, as well as Isitunzi. They have like a predominantly female cast as well as the crew um, and the team working behind from the commissioning editors, you know, are females. And, you know, we we want to celebrate, you know, those kind of initiatives where it's like, yes, women excellence is not a myth. You mm. know, it's a reality. Mm. Like, um, you can have a female DOP and director and it's actually a brilliant, brilliant film or TV series, you mm. know. So, so, so Zoe, so, um, just, just to kind of jump in there, I mean, and yeah. you're saying that there isn't an audience that's been created for... Um, the, the work that women put out. Um, can you elaborate on that? I mean, what, what does that mean? Because I, I know that there already is um, a bit of a struggle in trying to get South Africans to come and watch South African cinema anyways. Um, mm. What is the, the added uh, challenge for, for, for women? I mean, so isn't, that, isn't it just indicative of the fact that, that there really is such a small audience anyways. So, you know, I mean, wh why, why does a specific audience need to be created for the work that they do? So I would say that the major issue is that already, like you mentioned, the, 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 you know, the demand for local content, you know, in terms of film and the audiences for it. I mean, if you just look at the box office uh, numbers, when, you know, any international film comes out, the numbers are at a certain level. And I mean, then next thing you look at the figures for a local film, like I just was watch. I recently watched Catching Feelings mm. and the numbers are already so, so, so low, you know, um, it's, it's actually really, it's a, it's a industry issue, but particularly for women, you know, just having that opportunity to create something, um, the budgets you will receive are completely different from, you know, a male director. If there's a male director attached to a specific film, the budget, you know, the, the funders are willing to give a bigger budget because there's a sort of trust for it, mm. you know what I mean? There's very few female directors who are actually funded. Um, you know, it's, it's an extra added struggle to even get your film made. And so by the time you do have a film made, maybe it doesn't fit into, you know, the, 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 the scope of where the small audiences are, you know what I mean, for local content. Mm. So you've got to find alternatives, you know, you've got to take it to the smaller cinemas, you know, that, and that said, it's not to say, I mean, some of the best films that South Africa have come out of South Africa in the last two, three years, I mean, Happiness is a Four-Letter Word, Keeping Up with the Kansamis, those were women's films, you yeah, know. So, yeah. I mean, there is a change, but that said, it's, 
it's you know you they're the exception to the rule you know mm. Mm. and need it to be a norm it shouldn't be something that's you know oh the one or two that we can point out yeah absolutely mm. um so so yeah so the the third leg of of what you want to address with swift um so the so i've mentioned the skills and mentorship um I've also mentioned the sisterhood cinema, what we call to sisterhood cinema. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the major thing, obviously, is what we're discussing to do, which is advocacy. So, you know, we're not only advocating around sexual harassment, but what we immediately realized was an issue was the fact that, you know, of course, you know, we're going to work on things like equal pay and equal access, you know, to certain things. But a lot of women in the industry just didn't feel safe. You know, um, if you think of said culture, you know, it's very, very hierarchical. And within that hierarchy, it's very male dominated. And Mm. so it's a very difficult space for women to enter into. And on that, uh, women were pointing out that there's so much. I mean, it's a culture which is not only um, an industry culture or a said culture. I mean, it's a national culture that needs to change. But it's more visible in this particular space because there's sort of no rules. It's like, no, uh, it's its own, you know, a set is its own sort of little world that operates with its own rules and certain things. Yeah, and and that's kind of the the reason why it's it's so hard to address it or it has been so hard to address because of the fact that it's not, it's not regulated. And the fact Mm -hmm. that, that when you are creating a production that it isn't, a, a business that is set up to to be there for years it's set up to be there for a couple of weeks at a time so yeah. you have yeah these cases happening within that short space of time and mm. I, I remember you saying on on another interview once that you know that people will shut up purely because it's such a time pressured environment where it's like we it's just that. need to get this film done we just need to get the shot done before the sun sets, you know, then we can maybe deal with this afterwards. But there, there never is a, a space to deal with anything afterwards because everything is disbanded. And whatever, yeah, and whatever hierarchy you, you've set up within that space um, that you would think is one that you can trust just isn't there anymore. So, mm. so mm. yeah, it's it's a hell of a situation to, to bring yourself into. And, you know, Zoe, quite, quite frankly, and... And I, I'm, I'm the kind of person I'm totally fine with just chucking out my, my own, you know, weird thinking and vulnerabilities here. But the thing is, it's like with, with the South African, with the film industry and the TV in, industry, it's like you're so used to having, having to deal with that kind of chauvinism that's always there. You're used to coming into work and there to be sexual innuendos flying you're used to coming into work and and feeling yeah. intimidated uh-huh. by by male colleagues but mm. then it's it's almost like a it's considered like a rite of passage for uh, you know even even a, a, even a guy as well but you know for a female it's a rite of passage to be able to find your footing to be able to you know dish it back at the guy to be able to find your exactly. place as as a person so so what is what is wrong with that scenario <laughs> when I mean, it's so yeah, usual? Yeah. It's actually so problematic. So one of, at one of our meetings, we had discussions around this, particularly saying it's like as a woman on set or in you know, some of these environments, you have to recreate yourself. You can't be yourself. Mm. Either mm. you need to get there and create that tough exterior, no nonsense, and you, know, you get labeled as you know, a B-I-T-C-H, you know, like that's who you have to create yourself to be, mm. you know, in order to ward it off. Or you're the friendly girl who's happy <laughs> and you know, is actually yes, really cool with the guy. It's okay. It's exactly. okay. <laughs> you know, exactly. Yeah. You know exactly what I'm talking about, but yeah. it's that you can't just get on set and just be who you are mm. because what you are first is a woman, you know, yeah. when they see you. And I mean, if if you think about it, a young man who comes on set doesn't have to think about that. He just gets there and all he thinks is, I just need to do my job. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? I want to do my job well. And that's what women want to do. You know what I mean? Need to be in that position where all they're worried about is doing their job well. Not Mm -hmm. worried about, okay, so how am I going to deal with X, Y, and Z? Mm -hmm. How am I going to deal with it when, oh, someone starts calling me sweetie, you know? Yeah. Because it's going to happen. Oh, listen, sweetie, pass me that. And then you've got to now think. Like, 
you know yeah do am I, I say something lie? do is I irritate it? somebody do I you know, am am I going to be that spanner in the works uh yes, yes. exactly yes. and it's such a huge issue because that's already a block to you doing your job all mm. you want to do is do your job and do it well and already there's that added pressure if you're especially when you're doing something technical or in a position of authority already just because you're a woman people are questioning you so mm. you've got to have that added pressure to to do your job well which is not a problem yes. but it should be an issue you absolutely know what I mean? it, and no matter can I do my job well not oh i'm a woman so can i do, do my job well yeah you know? yeah yeah because it, it just seems like you're you're damned if you do and damned if you don't because if you have yeah. if you are in a position of power and mm. you say what it is that you you need to say you are considered a, a bitchy person there's like some exactly. way that you're expected to behave and yet if you if you kind of put on the facade of the you know the acquiescent person while still trying mm. to be a leader it mm. nobody is ever going to be happy with the way that you do things because <laughs> never yeah it literally is such a tricky space to be in yeah. and yeah. i mean i think the major issue that swift was dealing with is that besides just that uncomfortable feeling it's the the lack of feeling safe you know mm. In our survey that we put out, so what we did um, when we realized that this was an issue and an urgent issue yeah. uh, is that we put out a survey to women in the industry, um, you know, asking questions like um, what, like the, one of the major ones that always sticks in my head is the fact that um, I think it's 76% of women don't feel safe in the workplace. Mm. They just, like they have, they don't feel safe. I mean, that doesn't even make sense. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like where you work, but you don't feel safe. Gosh. You know, like you feel that at any point you're, 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 you're confronted by something that makes you feel that you're not in a safe space. And I mean, that's just, it's shocking. It's alarming and it's pro extremely problematic. Yeah. Because, but that, like kind of, it, that kind of thing doesn't necessarily come about by somebody being specifically antagonistic towards you or aggressive it, it's it's little i think you you, you call them microaggressions but yeah exactly. that tend to build up yeah so and, yeah. yeah sorry continue and so on particularly on that what the what we managed to also find is that sexual harassment you know the difficult thing about it is that it's so hard to define you know it's those microaggressions because someone thinks that oh no i need to be raped or you know, something huge has to happen for yeah. it to be actual sexual harassment. And then if it's not one of those major things, there's this whole questioning of yourself as to was that okay or was it not okay? Yeah. Like, just not sure, you know. And yeah. it's the microaggressions which you don't even know. Like I pointed out, if someone, you know, says to you, do you know how to do that? And you, you're not sure if they are, you know that they're asking you because you're a woman. You know what mm. I mean? And, oh, you probably don't know how to do that. It's the little things, you know what I mean? And, you know, the little comments of, oh, oh, sweetie, you know, like, make sure that you wear something tight tomorrow. You know, we have clients coming through. Yeah, yeah. Like, and you, I mean, nothing technically has happened, but it's those things that put you, like, I mean, with that particular situation, you feel that you, as a woman, have been singled out and you're sort of being put out there for something that you're not there for. You know yes. what I mean? Yes, yes. And, like, okay, so if my boss is telling me, I mean, your boss could be male or female, is telling me they're basically putting me out there. I'm like the sacrificial lamb for the client to, I mean, it's just uncomfortable. You know, yeah, and those yeah. little things that make, you know, I mean, someone, your boss telling you that, oh, no, you know, I, 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 you know, I spoke up for you, you know, when, you know, the client wasn't happy with your work, you know, so you own, you know, Ouch. Yeah. and you're like, okay, as a guy, what would you owe, what, like, you know what I mean? As a guy, what, what would I owe you? But yes. as me, as a female, like, now what is it? Do you get what I mean? You just yeah. don't know. Just so, so much, so many layers to it. Yeah. And, and it you makes know, you, it makes you question your own, your own value as well. Because if, if you've been told that you are essentially there to, you know, put a smile on the producer's face, what are you supposed to think about the work that you actually put out that it isn't worth anything? That, Exactly. Yeah. Um, I was reading a little bit um, from the, the report and yeah. I just want to read a couple of things just for 
people to really get to grips with what the report is about and what kind of situations women are finding themselves in uh, in the workplace. So uh, I also talk about act- actresses as well. But things like having meetings in strip clubs, <laughs> being denied a separate room or separate bed off-site or on festival business travel, uh, mm. phones not being banned on set and hence being used to film semi-nudity and full nudity scenes by crew and sundry, unpermitted, of course, by the actress. Um, this is happening all the time. Um, things that... that And when things get escalated, you have a situation that is something like this. Uh, Similarly, a woman who had been experiencing sexual harassment by a senior male colleague was later fired by her producer under suspicions that she was having an affair with him. This was despite having confided in her female executive producer who told her the sexual harassment was her fault. Where do I find a hammer to just smash my own head in? That's just... And oh. I agree. And I mean, it's one of these things that we, what we realized, even because within SWIFT, what we, what's really nice is that we do have a very mixed group of females. Um, so, you know, women who've been in the industry 20 to 30 years, you know, who are higher up in the ranks, and then young women who haven't even finished university, they're still studying film and looking to get into the industry. And it's interesting to hear because some of the older women within SWIFT are, you know, were admitting that a lot of the time when a young girl comes to them they are in a position of power but they just don't know what to do there is no recourse there's actually you know you're sitting there thinking okay if i fire this dop you know we need to get the product to client by xyz date um i don't even know how you it's just such a huge mission yeah because every every minute is is money in in the industry so yeah but and it's easier to tell her, you know, listen, sweetie, I'll make sure that, you know, you don't work next to him anymore. I'll keep him away from you, you know, mm-hmm. just to get things moving. Yeah. And what women were pointing out that even though they did want to help, there was no, there's actually no structure or recourse as to what to do. There's no, no one has defined how to deal with it. And so even within that space, you know, they feel like, okay, if I'm the woman who then stops the entire production, mm. because the guy you know, slapped her on the bum, you know, slapping her on the bum is such a huge deal. But in terms of, okay, now I shut down the production, people are going to look at me like, oh, this woman doesn't know how to deal with, you know, situations. At the end of the day, what you lost us, a, a, you know, a hundred thousand rand because someone, you know, yeah, so yeah. also expressing that for them, they would love to help, you know, in the survey, one of the questions was when you, um, you, 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 what's the word? When you see someone harassing someone else, do you want to help? And, you know, the unanimous answer was yes. Mm, and, mm. and do you know how to help? No. Yeah. But yeah. he knows how to help. You, you, like, there's just no structures in place. And, I mean, I'm sure we didn't, the survey didn't include men. It was specifically for women. But we've had at our meetings um, discussions where men also are like, you know, yeah, I've seen it, but you know, what do I really do, you know, yeah, besides, yeah. oh, stop that, or whatever, you know. Um, it, it does sort of speak to, to something deeper, and you did mention before, it's just the fact, you know, that before we were in the workplace, we are women. So, <laughs> you know, be, besides the, the harassment or the politics or the power play in, in, in work, we still have to deal with the fact that it's endemic to our society of how to deal with things. So, mm. um, it, it's like, my, my, my struggle in, in, in this is having been an actor in the industry and having seen this, and like I told you about the whole sort of rite of passage that you kind of yeah. need to go through. It's like yeah. if, if somebody slapped my bum, for instance, I will turn around and I'll know exactly what to say back to that person. Yeah. You know, yeah. And then kind of make a joke of it, that type of thing. Or, um, or if, if for, for instance, like nobody teaches actors which is so weird but they don't teach actors about what they're supposed to do on set when it's a sex scene what they're supposed to do um when it's even if it's just a kissing scene it's like how do you deal with your fellow actor you know they don't understand that oh a kissing scene or a sex scene is actually a very technical thing that you're doing purely for camera angles at the end of the day and Mm. you know to forward the 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 story along 
But it's like, if we had those basic tools of how to communicate properly, then surely it would help the situation. So it feels like everything has been failing us, not specifically as women, but just as human beings could, connecting to each other, <laughs> that mm. it just gets more and more exacerbated as as we go into the different industries, right? True, very yeah. true. And I mean, one of the major things, so just to point out, as as a result of the report um, mm. at Swift, what we, I mean, we started the report at the beginning of um, 2017. Um, what, we've, what we've done is we've been working over the last, uh, since then, since the report and the survey, at finding ways to solution it, to change, because it's a culture yeah. that needs to be dealt with, you know. And so we've used three major approaches. Um, so the PSAs, so what the PSAs are, they're public service announcements, little short clips, like I pointed out, you can see them online. Mm -hmm. If you type hashtag, that's not okay on YouTube. And we're coming out with six more, and we're going to keep bringing them out. They basically, um, they, 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 they show not the obvious things. You know, there's obvious things that it's like, okay, if you get raped, like, we all know that that's not okay. Mm -hmm. But it's the in-between little things. You know, with the instances that, and we used, you know, some of the, like, the, the, the feedback we got from women on the survey, yeah. you know, of instances that they've had where, you know, um, they've dealt with it. Those specific instances where it's like a gray area is what we wanted to portray with these PSAs. Mm -hmm. So they show, you know, little scenes, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, like when someone is micing you, you know, and they're, you know, just kind of their hands are just sort of wandering around for a little bit too long you know yep <laughs> <laughs> you know and you know just conversations like oh okay you know just sexual innuendos and like even direct like sexual advances yeah on sex, you know and like just um, instances where you do report to you know someone who's superior to you and that person like tells you to keep quiet mm. Like, mm. and it's basically listen which is the reality as in if you speak up you'll be labeled as a problem person and you won't work in this industry. This industry is so small and you'll get basically blacklisted, you know, yeah. as the girl who's a problem. So she's not cool to work with, you know. And yeah. so all of those little instances, what we wanted to do with the PSAs is to, to show them and say, that's not okay. So that even if someone has been doing it, if you're a man and you've been doing it, you can actually see that and be like, hmm, that's me, and I've done that a couple of times, and it can conscientize you to the fact that it's so uncomfortable for the other person. Because yeah. a lot of the time we see things from our perspective. You think it's funny. You think it's you're being cool. You think that you know you're making a joke, or maybe that's what you've just grown up seeing around you. You know, you think there's nothing wrong with it. Mm. You know, the the PSAs conscientize and educate you to what is okay and what's not okay. You yeah, know? yeah. Um, so where are you hoping that those PSAs are going to be shown? So. Obviously, we're definitely going to have them online because we want them to be as accessible as possible, you know, to everybody. But we're also working with um, the Durban um, Film Festival. So what we're aiming to have is them to be played before screenings, you know, mm -hmm. just to have them there for people who will be at the festival. But we're also looking to have them broadcast. Yeah. So we're speaking to a number of broadcasters to get them put out. Our first one, The Line Producer, was actually played on ETV during 16 days of activism, you know, oh, just awesome. up, yeah, to pick up, you know, the thread. Because once you get people, and, oh, the major thing that we're also looking for is that um, is to have them at the beginning of every production. You know, when you have the meet and greet, everybody gets to know each other, yeah. you know, stop to have one of them played, you know, I mean, they'll be between a minute and two minutes, so mm -hmm. they'll be quick. Mm -hmm. Have that played just to set the tone, you know, of what the production, or, you know, what's going to be, the tone and the vibe at the production, like we're not going to have this behavior, you yeah. know, and get the conversation started in that way so that if someone does want to then, you know, create a separate culture, everybody else is conscientized already. Mm. You know, mm. the general thing is that when someone is doing something wrong, everybody kind of feels uncomfortable, knows that there's something wrong, but it's like, oh, am I going to be that person who's going to be like, okay, you yeah. can't do that, you know, and it's like everyone else will think that you've got a problem. So what we want is that to set the tone, as in if you are going to start doing that, then everybody else's mind frame will already be like, that's not okay. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it will help women to also, you know, because a lot of the time it's a gut feeling. You know, you can't 
you don't know if someone asks you like what happened, what was wrong with what he did or said. When you try play it over in your mind, you're not like, oh, okay, well, I guess it wasn't that bad. But in your gut, you know that there was something wrong. Yeah. And so that is to validate, the PSAs are to validate that, yes, that's not okay. Mm. You know, you feel that gut feeling, you look and you say, yeah, nothing technically happened there. But your, your gut feeling, trust it, it yeah. wasn't, yeah. you know. So, um, Zoe, we, we spoke briefly earlier about um, a paper that you've also brought out uh, about the, the processes that you would like people to start following. Uh, is it specifically for the, the people working in the film industry on the technical side of things, or does it also cover um, uh, the acting side of things? Because so, in my yeah. mind, they're slightly different yeah. areas. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So... Mm. What we've come up with is uh, what's known as our code of good practice uh, mm -hmm. for sexual harassment. So most companies um, or corporates have a code of conduct which deals with, you know, the ethics of the company, what they, you know, how to behave, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what you pointed out, Chantal, is that with production, what the problem is, is that it's not a formal, um, formal structure that's there to exist for an extended period of time, mm -hmm. you know. Every production is sort of a new crew, new cast, new team put together for solely that purpose, you know what I mean, and then disbanded after that. Yeah. So the other major thing which Swift identified as an issue was the fact that, you know, actors, actresses, crew members are all not employees because of the formal, informal status of, you know, the way that w the production works. Everyone is an is a independent contractor or a freelancer. And so, therefore, the relationship between um, them as well as the person who's hired them is not the same as an employee-employer relationship, as, and that's in a legal sense. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, they, they don't have the same obligations to one another. So, for example, if you work in a corporate, um, there is HR that's available for you. You know, you are covered by the labor laws, but independent contractors and freelancers aren't covered by those particular um, um, laws. And so there is no HR, you know what I mean? That's not standard procedure to have an HR as it would be where you are if you are working in a corporate environment. So, for example, not to say that, you know, sexual harassment doesn't happen in corporate environments. And that's where we, are start, we want to push out to. We're starting with the film and television industry simply because there actually is no laws in place for actors and actresses, mm. crew members, cast you know, edit it, no one, because everybody's an independent contractor, you're not, there's no obligations from, you know, the person who's hired you, there's nothing legally standing there. So what the code of conduct is, is what we are, it's, a, it's sort of plugging that gap to say that you do have a legal leg to stand on, and there is something that you can do um, in terms of legalities if something happens to you. Because yeah. at the moment, there's absolutely nothing, and there's no procedure sort of set out you know, as to what to do. And that was one of the major issues because people, even if they do want to help, you know, they they can't think of how to actually do it, you know. Yeah, so yeah. the document sets it out um, quite nicely. Um, yeah. And so just to let you know what our strategy is with the Code of Conduct, it was released during um, the 16 days of activism. Um, like I said, when we had our PSAs and we had a media campaign around it. Mm -hmm. So we're looking to do it in a, a two-prong, two, up, uh, an, uh, from the top, goodness gracious me, I'm losing my words. Um, so we're looking at doing it uh, in two different ways, from the top. So looking at all the funders, we've been speaking to the NFBF, the DTI, the DAC, um, all the film commissions, Kauten, K KZN, you know, West Grow and Cape Town, and speaking to them, and a lot of them have signed our MOU, the majority of them have signed our MOU to basically say that when production companies come to them for funding, um, that they will make it a stipulation in order to um, access funding that they have a code of conduct around sexual harassment, you know. And the MOU basically is them showing their willingness to do it. And mm -hmm. what's now in place is them obviously working through the legalities because these are all, you know, bureaucratic uh, institutions. So they've yeah. got to get it, you know, implemented properly. You know, they've got to change policy, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But they've all, all shown an indication that they're willing to do this. Okay. You know, which is amazing. Yeah, um, that's a fantastic leap. <laughs> They're low step. Then from, from, from the other side, we're working with, um, so for example, for the actors with Saga, South African Guild of Actors, um, the PMA, the 
you know, um, the IPO, the producers, the uh, DFA, Writers Guild, all of these call a crew, all these crewing agencies and them, just basically all the industry bodies. And they have also signed up MOU so that when someone wants to use, so I'm looking for a writer, I'm looking for a producer, I'm looking for an actor. If they're under any of these organizations um, or industry bodies, um, they will push to say, okay, if you'd like Chantal to come and act, um, thank you for the contract, but do you guys need to add a code of conduct here? Do you guys have one? Oh, you don't have one? Mm. Here we will yeah. provide one because our actors won't go out without you know, this code of conduct. Our you know, editors, our camera assistants, our writers, no one will work yeah. you know, without this code of conduct. So we're trying to put pressure from both sides so that you know, just even the, in, you know, the IPO pushing their producers or the production companies that are signed up with them do you have a code of conduct? Because once we have it in place, I mean, again, it's a secondary education. If Even if you don't read the entire, you know, document, we've really made an emphasis to try and make it short so that people do. Yeah. But even if you don't read the entire document, you it forces you to think, what is this extra thing that I'm signing? You know what I mean? Mm. And, oh, okay, so now I'm actually legally liable if I do sexually harass someone. Like, okay, so what's going to happen? You yeah, know? yeah. So already creating that educational process, you know, where people, we, I mean, we define what sexual harassment is, you know, so even for a young girl on set, if she's read it in black and white that someone can't do this to me, she'll have more confidence to speak up and say, you know, you can't do that. Mm, as a, mm. the way, Like, I don't even know because I'm new here and so I just need to play along, you yes, know. Yes, absolutely. So, um, I mean, that that is phenomen phenomenal. It, it just... Fills me with so much hope <laughs> of where we can be at least in the next, you know, five to ten years of how the industry can change. It's amazing. Um, yeah. I do, I do have to ask though, because with actors who are linked in with Saga, if they're Saga members, they mm -hmm. do have recourse as far as arbitration is concerned and being able to, you know, take the matter further into, um, you know, a, a court of law. Mm -hmm. Is that the same with you guys? Is that what you're trying to move towards? I mean, is there some sort of legal body that um, uh, helps you, uh, SWIFT? Or is that what you're looking at? Yes. Yeah, so with Saga, I mean, um, Carlin from Saga was hugely instrumental in the drafting of the Code of Conduct um, because obviously she pointed out that um, they have been working on it for years. And so she was so happy that I think, you know, it shows when a bunch of women come together and want to <laughs> It actually happened. Yeah, that is that is absolutely right. Because I mean, you've you've only been around for a year, and mm. the the amount of, of forward motion that has happened and mm. and power, you guys are all over the place. It's just fantastic. So, gee, mm. kudos to you. I mean, I mean, it's women. When women put their minds to something and want to make it happen, it happens. Yeah. You know. <laughs> so, um, with Saga, what we were talking about is the fact that there isn't an actual document. So. Currently, I think what Saga does is they do support, you know, um, the actor and, you, you know, they can put all of that in place, you know, the legal mm -hmm. proceedings in place. But what if there isn't a document, the document is, you know, it adds to what mm. to the weight of what your case will be. Do you see what I mean? If, yeah. As opposed to just a he said, she said that we're trying to create a legal obligation between, um, say, the actress and whoever the perpetrator is. Because if there has been a legal document signed, you know, they can't, there's a lot more there's of a legal le leg to stand on. Yeah. So as what we are working with, uh, we have a partnership with Lawyers for Human Rights, um, who will assist, pro, uh, you know, pro bono with cases of members of SWIFT. You know what I mean? If there is allegations, you know, they, they're there to support and give legal counsel. And if necessary, you know, take it further. Mm -hmm. uh, actual legal court proceedings. And another one of our partners is um, Lifeline, um, who so generously have offered that if there is a case, you know, because the major thing with SWIFT is that we want to support women in when they come forward, which is one of the major things why, I'm, I mean, I'm sidetracking a little bit, once, but one of the questions was, why can't uh, SWIFT push for a sort of Me Too movement, you know, where we push women to speak up, you know? Um, because, I mean, we started working on this, you know, a good eight months before the Weinstein um, incident happened. Yeah, yeah. But what we didn't want was to push women to rush forward and speak up and, you know, 
throw these allegations out there and, you know, tell their stories if we didn't have a safety net to catch them. Absolutely, you know? yeah. Because the women who are speaking up in Hollywood, a, a lot of them are very well established, you know, so, you know, they have something to fall back on and, you mm. know, they've got something to actually protect them. We didn't want to make women even more vulnerable by saying, speak up now. Yeah. And, you know, hopefully... Yeah, and, and technically speaking, they do have a strong a strong union uh, mm. here, here in South Africa. For some reason, it still doesn't make sense for people to to belong to Saga, uh, who isn't a union, but you know, it's it's a guild that's there to to protect us as actors. And um, yeah, I mean, just just think about the 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 strength that all these organisations would have if you know we as actors or as women working in film. Uh, you know, realize that we do have the numbers and that we do have power uh, in in having those numbers to be able to speak our truth to power. So, yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to those days <laughs> when the yes. penny drops. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. I mean, we are actually offering, we, we're offering multiple solutions. So when someone comes through um, and reports an incident of sexual harassment, you know, we've got obviously a standard procedure which is being actually set up and structured now um, where we basically ask, are you safe right now, you know? Yeah, and if yeah. not, they deal with that first, you know, moving you from there. But just down to like setting out um, timelines. Okay, so what happened? Who said what? What time did this happen? What date did this happen? You know, all those things that can create a good case for you if you mm -hmm. are to take it forward because a lot of the time, when things are happening, you know, it's all such a mess and then that's how later, you know, your story gets discredited because you don't have the basics down and, you know, maybe your story now sounds shaky because you can't remember things. Yeah. So we put that down and then once we've established the fact of it, we ask them, what would you like, you know, from this? These are the options we offer, which are, you know, would you like counselling? Because some people, you know, it's actually one of the major things that I always point out. To stand up and, you know, bring allegations forward, whether it's rape, sexual harassment, etc., is opening yourself up. We have to be honest, mm. opening yourself up to like a basically a second violation. Because if you do take a court, uh, a case to court, your 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 character, who you are, is what they're going to attack. Mm. And you know, every sort of sexual involvement with anyone you've had is going to be called into question. And they're going to, I mean, they have to discredit you. You know what I mean? Yeah. In order to defend whoever it is that they're defending, the perpetrator. And so it's almost like a second violation that you have to be ready for, yes. you know. So that's why we also, you know, it has to be your choice. You ha we can't force women to take things for, for further. So we ask them what they would like, you know. Mm. Maybe they like, you know, just a basic um, mediation process, you know, where there's like, you know, the person spoken to and they can come forward and apologize, you know, that sort of thing. We do have place uh, procedures like that in place as well. Yeah. Uh, where it can be that sort of a thing. Maybe they're given a written warning. Maybe, you know, we speak to the, if, they, if they're part of the production company, we speak to them through mm -hmm. the IPO to say, how are you dealing with this? What have you done about the situation? Maybe the person gets fired from the set, you know. Yeah. Maybe you yeah. don't want it to go to court, but you want that sort of situation to happen, you know. Mm -hmm. so, so is we, it is it something that you are encouraging people to report as it's happening? Is that what this is? Okay. Definitely. As mm. it happens, because lines get blurred later, mm. you know. Mm. You've thought about it. As something happens, you know, you think about it and your mind rethinks it. Oh, maybe I yeah. should have. And, you know, it becomes as it becomes a little bit more muddled. And that's naturally how mm. memory works. You know yeah. what I mean? You add things that weren't necessarily there. And sometimes you, you know, but if you report it as soon as possible and someone is guiding you through the process, you know, you're still fresh. The facts are still fresh. You know exactly what happened. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. The, uh, um, the report that came out uh, just recently, I know that you, you had sent out a survey last year in order to, you know, start getting that information in. But I'm pretty sure now that that report is out that you probably have a lot of people coming forward and saying, yeah, well, you know, me too. Um, what do you do with those stories? Um, is it an ongoing survey? Is uh, what, what does one do with, uh, you know, all these stories coming forward? Because I know there are going to be many of them. Are you able to, to cope with it? Have you got a specific process with those ones or just stuff that's happened in the past? So... We, we basically, if there's situa if it's something that's happened in the past, um, 
it's the same thing. What like what 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 would you like Swift to do? Yeah. You know? Yeah. If you want to take legal action, we do have um, various channels, like I mentioned, Lawyers for Human Rights, mm -hmm. as well as a partnership with Sakia. Um, Sakia is the umbrella body for all um, communications in, in, in the communications industry. So not oh, okay. only does it house the film and television industry, it's got the broadcasters, telecoms, et cetera, et cetera. So they're an umbrella body that um, we are partnered with, mm. and they actually do have... Um, the right to arbitrate you know so arbitration is a process where you basically it's like a mini court outside yeah of court yeah yeah with um it's le the decisions made they are legally binding mm -hmm. so that's another uh, option that we offer people you know what i mean mm -hmm. like want this to be go to arbitration mm -hmm. Yeah. So in, in order to be able to um, get these benefits, does one have to be a member of SWIFT? Definitely, because mm -hmm. just on a basic level, for example, with Sakia, um, they can only protect people who are their members, their, their affiliate members, because then they have the right, the legal right. Because if you're just a random off the street, they can't summon you, you know yes, what I mean? Or yes, Present you. So through our affiliation with Sakia, um, then you, as a member, you are then affil an affiliate member to Sakia. Oh, so okay. it's necessary for you to actually be a member so that you have, you know, a legal, they have a legal obligation to protect you. you All right. Okay. Yeah. So how is one able to then, you know, get a hold of your membership form? So um, it's on our Facebook page. It's on our Twitter page. They post it, uh, I think, every two days. So that's mm -hmm. sort of at the top. You just click on the link and it's very simple. You fill out your details. Yeah. Um, you can make an online payment. It's 350 for the entire year. So, I mean, that's less, so than, what? 30, <laughs> yeah, it's less than 35 rand um, a month, Jeez. really. You know, And then we also have student membership for 150. So, I mean, that's like 15 rand, less than 15 rand a year. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, just sign up on there and then you immediately get added to our database. We also have a great WhatsApp group. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, you do, you do. <laughs> You're on the WhatsApp. Group. I am. That's how I found you. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's amazing. That's um, when I was talking about the different pillars for Swift. One yeah. of the ones that I didn't mention was networking. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what we do on that members group, where we offer each other opportunities first. You know, um, I mean, you know, Chantal, on that mm -hmm. group every other day like every day there's just different jobs i'm looking for someone to do continuity yes looking for um someone to do xyz um you know this is the job we need you tomorrow like please send my seat your cvs in yeah like yeah. we'll just offer each other opportunities first as women you know? yes and i think it's amazing because the the whole vibe of that group is just one of such generosity of spirit it's it's it's, it's wonderful to be a part of it really is yeah mm -hmm. and just information sharing mm -hmm. you know like um today someone attended the SABC meeting yeah. and a lot of women obviously are working, you know how it is in this industry, you're working a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And so someone just created a, a Dropbox link with all the slides to say, this is what I learned and I want, you know, to yes. share. Yes. It's very, very, very amazing. And I mean, it's also a safe space. You know, there's a lot of women who've asked, look, I don't know how to do X, Y, Z. I don't know what the standard rate for, you know, translating. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you learn from... The other women there you know and that's what we you know swift is all about it's about yes. sharing yes, yeah for sure and and you also have uh information evenings or master classes that you offer um just quickly tell us about that before okay. we then um so basically in cape town i think it's every two months that um there's a meeting um so it's always centered around either screening mm -hmm. or um having something some someone come in and talk about something you know Joburg, we have ours monthly um, and in Durban, I think they're doing quarterly um, because they're not as uh, the, the the group there hasn't as much hasn't grown as much. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the meetings can be anything. Like I mean, we had um, in Joburg, the last meeting we had was oh the release of the report. Yeah. Uh, so we talked about that. But the meeting before that was you know some an expert on VOD platforms, um, just educating us on how to get your if you have a web series if you're looking at having one or what are the requirements for VOD, you know, so yes. that we know, you know, we're having the NFV, F and DTI come and talk to us about the application processes, you know, what are what are we entitled to as women, what's different for us, and just talk us through this form because it's yes. so confusing sometimes. You know? <laughs> like, like just giving, we, we want every opportunity available to women 
to actually be available to them. You know yes, what I mean? Like yes. we want it to know so that we get as many of us into the industry as possible. And the beauty of these events is the networking, I must say. That, for me personally, has been the hugest benefit. You know, just meeting amazing women who are doing amazing things yeah, and yeah. You know, just knowing each other. I mean, for example, if you're an actress and I'm making a film, I'll be like, oh, you know, Chantal's the perfect person like yeah, actually yeah. for this that I've been working on. You know what I mean? And knowing one another is so huge. It's such a big deal. You know what I mean? Like mm. knowing the producers, knowing the directors, getting yourself out there and it is the space for that you know it's you know so for example if i was to see you know the head of hbo at a dinner which is for charity or whatever it might be difficult for me to walk up to her and be like hi i've always wanted to meet you etc etc it might be awkward Mm. but swift is exactly that you know you've got women who've been in the industry for years and years and years and they're there because they're also keen to meet with you know younger women up and coming you know they're a lot yeah. of the women, you know, I when I'm growing up or when I'm casting, I want to work with women, but I just don't know them. You know what yes. I mean? I don't know yeah. where to find them. And so Swift has created that platform for us to know each other. Ah, fantastic. And I'm, I'm sure the, the older generation of um, female directors and, you know, people working in film have really been craving this kind of connection as well because it doesn't, it, it hasn't really been there. It's been such a, a disparate bunch of, of people working on their own trying to make it work. So, wow, I, I'm just so impressed with you guys. I really am. I think it's fantastic that Swift is around, that it's available, that it is, um, you know, that it's making or at least potentially able to make so many of these huge changes that we really need in the industry. And you guys, along with Saga, I think is going to be a force to be reckoned with in, in the country. So I'm, I'm incredibly excited. And, and thank you so much for all the hard work that you've done so far. Oh, it's creating an industry that's going to be better for not only us, but for, you know, the future generations of, you know, girls who are growing up now who are aspiring to be in the industry, mm. you know, for them to arrive and not find the situation the same or worse, oh. but for them to find it better, you know what I mean, and more conducive to them and more accepting of them, you yes. know. Amen to that. So thank you so much for your time, Zoe. I really, really appreciate it. And thank you so much to the viewers or the listeners of the podcast today. Uh, Rock This Universe Actors Edition. Thanks for joining me. Uh, all the links that we've spoken about in this particular podcast, I'm going to make sure that they're uh, either on Facebook in the Facebook group, that's uh, SA Actors Rock This Universe, as well as wherever I'm putting this podcast. It'll be YouTube, it'll be Podbean, definitely. And wherever you see it, I'll make sure that those links are up. And of course, you can go to the uh, Swift Facebook page, which is... Uh, Sisters Working in Film and Television. There you go. All right. So all the information is there for you. Uh, Make sure you get your membership form as soon as possible. Get in there. And yeah, thanks so much again for everything. Cheers, guys.